and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning and artificial intelligence. If you'd like to think of data as the new oil, then you can consider us car talk because we focus on where the rubber meets the virtual road. And with me, as ever, on this epic road trip down the information superhighway is my co-host, Andy Leonard. How's it going, Andy? Good, Frank. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Speaking of road trips, I hear you had one heck of a road trip. (laughs) Well, yeah, it was uh, probably the farthest I've ever gone. It was almost halfway around the world. I went to the Data Platform Summit which uh, wrapped up this past week. Um, uh, We're recording this on the 13th of August, 2018. And um, it was last week in uh, Bangalore, uh, Bengaluru, India. Nice. And yeah, it was a great conference. Um, I I learned some stuff. I got to present some. And, you know, what can I say? You know, community. It's all community stuff, at least for me. I, I enjoy connecting with people. I got to see friends that I usually only get to see in Seattle and, um, you know, made some, made some new friends. I got nice. to explore the Indian culture. I had never been to India before. And I'd love to tell you, I went out and toured and had a great time, but you know, Frank, the truth is uh, the way I describe my travel and I, I do quite a bit, uh, for work is I write, in hotel rooms in some of some of the most exotic and far-flung places on the planet um so that's what i did unfortunately as i i stayed in the hotel room and wrote way too much but it's good it's a good good writing way too much we did go shopping on the last day uh, i was there my wife and daughter had sent a list of <laughs> things to pick up. so i i did my best i couldn't get all of them but I did get enough and they were, they were pleased, but yeah, good, good trip. Um, and I, I know that, uh, I know you've been busy. I know some things you can't talk about, but I know some things you can. And I know for a fact, in fact, I, I'm going to tease this. Frank is working on what I consider to be like a really cool, uh, pivotal type of idea. And I can't go farther than that. And I know it's too early to announce it, but I absolutely love this idea. I'm excited about it. I'm going to try and help as much as I can, but it's uh, it's an exciting idea. What, what can you talk about that you've been doing, Frank? So I can talk about that uh, apparently yesterday, um, Siraj Raval is someone that we'd love to have on the show. Uh, he's a very animated um, YouTuber that talks about data science and AI. And um, I'm hoping to get him on the show, but he's starting up this initiative called School of AI. And I have been named a dean of the School of AI. And I am uh, basically co-running kind of uh, his plans for Washington, D.C. Wow, Frank. Now. That, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm a dean now. Which I, I'm not dean sure if that means Levinia. like a music group leader. No, that hey. won't work. Dean <laughs> It would work if you pronounced it Levine, but it's Lavinia. Oh, Dean Levine. Actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he would run. It, it was alliteration at its best. Absolutely. No, that's, that's rhyming. It is rhyming. You're right. Data driven really is right alliteration. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it one of those square and rectangle things, I wonder? It's something like that, parallelogram. It could it, could it like be? That. I don't know. Anyway, that's awesome. So what what's going on, though? So when is he starting up? How's this going? Uh, I think it's just starting today. I'm on the Slack channel and there's a lot of chatter about, okay, now what, you know, mm. <laughs> but, um, but it's cool. Cause he's, he's definitely a very creative person. Oh yeah. Um, definitely, definitely. I think an influential person in, in this space. He's done some interesting things. He's, uh, definitely a very passionate guy. You can't help, but get excited when you watch his, uh, his video. So true that. So speaking of video, our guest this week is someone that I met basically through, I forget if it was Channel 9, Microsoft Virtual Academy, or one of the edX classes. Um, she stood out because her Twitter handle is rheartspython, or something like that. And we can get a correction from her if I'm wrong. 
Uh, but she started as an R programmer uh, at Revolution Analytics. And now she um, is a software development engineer at Microsoft. And uh, in the inter- interim, though, she had a title of data scientist. And we'll kind of talk about why she went from data scientist to software development engineer. Want to get, because I remember seeing that on LinkedIn, thinking like, hmm, because I noticed a, a bunch of people did that. And I was wondering if there was some larger macro trend going on. But uh, our guest this week is Micheline Harris. So welcome to the show, Micheline. Hey, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. Thanks for coming on. I think I first saw you. I don't I want to say it was a, a Power BI video where you were talking about the R uh, functionality that was just added. But I don't remember exactly. It might have been me. might have been Buck Woody, uh, who I worked with. <laughs> I think cool. you guys know Buck. <laughs> yes, Buck's been on the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've made a, a couple of videos. Um Definitely. I was trying not to giggle too much uh, at your <laughs> <laughs> introduction um, because it was awesome. It, Thank was, you. it was right on. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So cool. So you worked. Uh, well, I also noticed that you were uh, in uh, before you worked at uh, Revolution Analytics, you were doing what I can only assume is kind of bioinformatics. Or- you were spot on. It was totally bioinformatics. That is actually my schooling. So Interesting. that is where, I mean, that's, I, I don't know if we'll probably talk about it, but that is literally where I started in data. So Interesting. No, no, that's, um, bioinformatics is one of those things where it's definitely on my list of things I want to look more into, but my list of things I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> I have that list too. <laughs> grows longer and longer every day. And with every idea I get, it kind of becomes this, um, never ending treadmill, but I kind of like it. It's fun. It keeps me, uh, keeps me motivated. That's for sure. I know the, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so, so talk to us, uh, cause we had Lynn Langan on the show who, um, has done some interesting stuff. She was our second or third guest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I forget the exact order, but I, forget um, too. I think it was, it was second or third. Uh, and she's done some interesting things in terms of cancer research. So, so what exactly did you do in the bioinformatics? Because that's my only exposure in, uh, visual uh, into bioinformatics is in regards to cancer research. Is that it, it, obviously there's probably more to the field? Uh, yeah, actually, there um, there is more. Uh, interestingly enough, I did do some cancer research um, in a field called proteomics. Um, but I really started, I guess, my my informatics journey with infectious disease. Interesting. So, yeah, it was just I had this little school project where I was looking for what's called um, pathogenicity markers. So why is why is Salmonella pathogenic, right? Like mm-hmm. what what in its genome causes causes it to be dangerous for us? Uh, so I was I was looking at the genes and and the proteins involved and. So it's sort of like a combination of computer science and biology and biochemistry. Interesting. Um, because I could not decide what I wanted to study in college and found out I don't have to decide because there's a field <laughs> for me. <laughs> yep. That's cool. So yeah. what made you go into revolution analytics? Like what? Yeah. No, that's a super great question. It, so I um, basically, I was in academia, right? So even the nonprofit I worked for, uh, Systems Institute for Systems Biology, was uh, basically academic. I had learned a lot of R because R kind of started, well, started by a bunch of statisticians uh, a long, long time ago, but the, the biology field really picked it up and ran with it. So there's like some organizations in Seattle that have created tons of packages for our, I mean, R has like 8,000 packages anyway, but it's like right. no jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. and for the longest time, it was the only game in town, right? I mean, yeah. this type of work. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it was like, uh, I was doing a lot of R programming in the field of biology in academia. And I'd never had an industry job before. So I decided one day I would I just apply. Like it was like 10 p.m., you know, in the middle of the night, essentially. And I 
put in an application to Revolution Analytics. And I there was this one field that was like, tell us something fun about yourself. Uh, so I wrote in it, you know, I bleed orange because I'm actually from, I went to school, University of Texas in Austin. So I'm actually like a Longhorn. Right? Oh, cool. And then they called me the next day, which was pretty cool. I had no idea if it had to do with the fact that, you know, I wrote this silly thing, but um, then I started working for them and, and it was amazing because I not only had never done industry, but like I, I was, I, you know, I'd never done consulting. So I was billable. They really threw me in the, into the deep end, but in a wonderful way. Like uh, they were like, yeah, you're billable, you know, your first day. So there you go. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> wow, I'm like this little academic person, you know, coming, coming into this big world. Um, but I had such a blast, you know, and um, because of the, the art background, I think they just, they really wanted to have me, which was super cool. Um, and then six months later, we got acquired by Microsoft. So your timing is on point. That's for sure. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, yeah, it's my journey has been, I feel like it's been really, uh, just like fortunate, um, throughout, like I've made some good decisions, but I feel like a lot of decisions, you know, I haven't made, but I've gotten really lucky. Um, so, you know, hence I'm, that's kind of my story ish up to Microsoft. Um, so there you go. <laughs> cool. So one of the things that, that struck me was, um, your Twitter handle, uh, what is it? Our hearts Python or our heart Python. Yeah, it's the second R heart Python. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that phenomenon, everyone's like X heart Y or ah, gotcha. Yeah, that whole like heart, you know, I heart New York or <laughs> I less than three or something like that. Yeah. You can't do that in Twitter handles, I guess. Yeah, so. I guess, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> what is the uh, typically, you know, the technology industry? They they love to have rivalries. You know, in the ancient times, there was, um, you know, VB versus C sharp, and then it became Java versus ActiveX, and 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 right up to today, I mean, there's the R versus Python. You chose a different path, R, heart Python. So so what do you, you as someone who's obviously well-skilled in kind of the R language, how would you describe the, the, the rivalry? And how would you describe like the different philosophies between the two languages? Wow, that's, I love that question. And I'm like, yeah, like I've thought about it um, a bit. I started, so from my take, um, I feel like, you know, honestly, one or the other is going to get you a long way. Um, I don't think, you know, much like, I guess maybe I can't choose because like I couldn't choose between computer science and biochemistry. So I can't really choose between R and Python. But <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, our heart Python. And actually I, I was on the search. My first blog post was about a package in Python that where you could call R, you could actually write R in Python code. And then I sure. found the equivalent, right? Like R Py, R Py 2. And then there's the equivalent in R for Python. Oh. Um, yeah. I, I saw the package name and I assumed it had something to do with the Raspberry Pis. Yeah, it's actually the the marriage of R and Python. So I know Raspi Raspi is boy, I'm in that world right now. So I interesting. I that, yeah. But yeah, um, I definitely want to talk about what you're doing now. Particularly of interest is that um I think I saw you teach one of these edX classes or something like that. And this is when I was uh outside of Microsoft. Um and uh I saw that your title had and a couple other people had switched from data scientist software development engineer and at the time i was outside looking in and i kind of was scratching my chin like hmm i wonder what that means what what are the tea leaves telling me so what <laughs> if you can talk about what happened did you change orgs did you change roles or is it just kind of uh the term data scientist is not the hot thing that it was like a couple of years ago yeah, I think, oh my God, data, the, the title is, I think it's just super, super hot. So um, I feel like, you know, folks are, there are all those programs and, and even majors now in data science. I, I think that's that's definitely like 
if someone wants to do data science, that's a route that, that I would say go for it. Um, that being said, for me, um, what happened was I was actually, so I was a data scientist for two years um, and I was a trainer. Uh, so hence I was working with some folks like Buck Woody. Um, and, and why we, you were doing those videos. And why I was doing those videos. Got it. Uh, actually the, the latest videos on channel nine, I was, I'm in my current role as a developer. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was just a matter of, of the position that I moved into was actually the, the title software developer. And I wanted it so badly that I said, Hey, you know, that's okay with me, um, changing titles. And I guess like, also, I really like this. So it was an org change within Microsoft from like, I was actually in engineering under Azure. And then I switched to this place called commercial software engineering. So we work like pretty closely with, with the enterprise customers. So I, I'm back to my feeling like, a just working with the customers on their real problems. And um, what happened was the org I joined said, hey, like we're developers and we, you know, our titles are as developer. Uh, what I thought was cool is their their philosophy. And that is, you know, we, we are the voice of the developer, so we need to be a developer. Um, and I, that really appealed to me. I was like, yeah, right on, like I, I I want to be a developer, you know, and have that have that voice, but also bring my data science, you know, to that voice. And I end up, I actually end up doing like hundred times more data. I don't know if that's a right factor, but like a ton more data science than I've ever done before, because I'm working with these customers that have like data science and machine learning workloads. Um, you know, everyone wants the AI component of their product or they want to intelligently do sound or, you know, speech or text or vision, you know, incorporated into their app. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at, uh, where I'm at now. But like I said, I, I love it because I get to do the data science stuff um, as a developer and I can speak more, I don't know how to put it exactly, but um, I, I am a developer and I, I can go to like a conference saying, you know, stand up, I'm a developer, but I do data science, you know, so can you. <laughs> right, like, right, right. Well, right? I think those walls yeah. are coming down. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Andy and I have kind of had that the debate on other shows where it's kind of like, you know, there was a time when developers wouldn't touch data and right. vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah. definitely mixing, um, you know, and, and the more, you know, the more we cross the streams, I think just the better it gets for both developers and data people. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, you know, the teaching or the education part of it is, is so critical too. you know, the, and also, but, but standing up and saying the, Hey, you know, look what I, I've done this. You can too. I think is is just really like a, a message I like to to put across or um, just communicate. Um, yeah, but it's blending. It's everything is blending. Uh, it's really really neat. I worry sometimes though that you know I I need to be an expert in in like both realms. And there's this thing too about choosing what you want to put your time into. And I grapple with that for sure. Well, isn't that the crazy. truth, though? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andy. That's okay. No, go ahead, Frank. That's good. No, question. isn't that the truth, though? I mean, there's just so many shiny new things that I just want to play with, but uh, like bioinformatics, but I just don't have the bandwidth. I mean, time seems to be um, the ultimate luxury or the ultimate resource. Yeah, exactly. I was going to pick on Frank because I know he's wasting like three or four hours a night sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, Frank, I hear you. Um, and 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 you too, Andy. Uh, you guys do a lot of um, uh, these MOOCs, the, yes. the massive online something something courses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the the online learning uh, with certificates and whatnot. So that's really cool. Yeah, I think right. I'm at like thirty something now. I was gonna say Frank is the uh, is the master of that. I'm still I'm the Padawan. I cannot snatch the pebble from his hand. 
<laughs> I think I've only got like 10 or something, but yes. Frank That's 10 more than I have. But... Well, he's a machine. <laughs> Let me tell you, he, uh, he cranked right through those and he's going to be one of those, uh, one of those triple crown people here next quarter when he finishes the AI cert. Yeah. So. Yeah. That I'm, uh, that I'm uh, excited for to finish that one. Uh, cool. I almost finished it this time around, but I just, uh, just got wrapped up in some, some work things now that I'm in a sales motion, sales type of role. Um, you know, the customer work has to come first. So, you know, it's a, it's a different experience, but, um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I cranked through them. And actually one of the ones I, I just finished was the, uh, reinforcement learning one, which was oh, wow. one of the hardest ones, one of the coolest ones, but one of the hardest ones. And again, my sample size is considerable because I, I have like 30 of these MOOCs, um, you know, under my belt. And it was just like, that one was brutal. Wow. Yeah. But which one, I mean, was it one of your favorites or? It, at the time it was not, but now. <laughs> No, <laughs> because I'd love, I mean, honestly, I just, I'd love to pick your brain sometime about, you know, how I should go about doing that. Like, uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the, I take the, the YouTube course route. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I just, I don't know if I'm like trying to save money or something, but man, like that would, that's kind of a huge goal of mine, Frank, is to, to start down that certificate path. For sure, um, because it, it just it it adds so much, you know. If we do that in our day job, like I use everything I learn usually, uh, and I feel like I have to learn so quickly sometimes. Yeah, um, you know what I mean. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean one of the things I did. So um, I, our listeners kind of know the story, but you may not. But um, uh, hopefully, although after today you'll be a listener. Uh, is that, I am uh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, is that, uh, you know, I found myself kind of laid off and I was a primarily Windows phone, Windows development guy. And I realized that, you know, the opportunities for that are not uh, wide and deep. <laughs> and um, uh, I decided to pivot hard into data science. And I thought the best way to do that would be to take as much online training as I possibly could. Um, and our last show, actually, that we recorded just before Andy went to India was was kind of about that. Because we got a lot of questions. Well, how do I get into this? What's better? What's a better path? And we kind of uh, beat that to, uh, I think, a pulp. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think one of the things that I, I kind of had to do was learn how to learn. And I think that's something that uh, a lot of people don't realize. And if you can optimize every minute of your day, this is something I got from Tim Ferriss. Uh, I listened to a lot of podcasts to, uh, before I kind of got into the space, a lot of audio books uh, about how, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you become obsessed about something? Like, how do you get into something? How do you, how do you do that? And um, there's a whole reading list I could, uh, I could give you if you're interested or audiobook list, if you're interested, Micheline. Yes, actually, I, I did start listening to you guys' podcast um, after you contacted me. Cool. And I just love it. Like I've been following it ever since. Awesome. And uh, so if you have any recommend, yeah, feel free to, shoot recommendations my way of interesting podcasts or even courses. Like I'm one of those people. I, I also consume things. Um, but I, yeah, like I've recently, you know, I got into watching videos, which I never thought I was very good at learning through a video. Mm -hmm. Um, and I found now that's my favorite medium. You know, it's like, it's like finding, you got to find your, your right medium. Uh, that you learn well in. So oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I find myself now at physical conferences looking for the button to go to like one and a half or two times speed. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's just the best way to multiply your time is, is to just, you know, focus on one thing and kind of watch it at two speed. I mean, it's just, um, it sounds crazy, but once you kind of do it, you, you're hooked on it. In fact, uh, a mutual friend who is now a Microsoft employee, we're not going to name him. He kind of elbowed me. He goes, you know, I really wish I could double the speed of this presentation. And that <laughs> I made me scratch my chin and go, you know, now that you mention it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that, that makes total sense. And and then you have, you know, time for more things, right? Absolutely. Uh, super smart. Super smart. Um, so, um, 
Do you have any questions, Andy? I know I was looking at the list. I was thinking we've, we've done uh, done a good job covering uh, good introduction material. And uh, I was just looking at the, our, our standard question list. So, so I'll start off with the standard question list um, oh. is, uh, you know, did you find your way into data or did data find you? Like, how did you get your, how did you get into data? I know you mentioned that you were, couldn't decide between, um, you know, uh, computer science or uh, bio biology, and you kind of found it's not an either or thing; it's a yes and type uh, equation. Oh gosh, uh, that's a that's a really cool question. I, uh, you know, if I, I sit and think about it, which I I have a little bit, you know, in the past, I'd have to say data snuck up on me, like. <laughs> You know, kind of like, hey, I'm a small amount of data. You want to you wanna play? Let's go. And so it was, you know, I, I, went to, I went to grad school for just a little while before I decided that, no. Um, but <laughs> I, I, was, I was in this, like, crazy PhD program. And then I, yeah, anyway. But we were um, doing some work in, in like, the, the – small protein data sets and it was cool because we had this like uh, 3d 3d structures essentially they're just 3d structures and but that's data it's like points right like right. points 3d points xyz um so it's just starting to think about instead of the mathematics and you know yeah like you, you can do a lot of stuff in the you know mathematics but how can i actually work with this data where it's at, um, you know, and, and, and get insights from, from this data, you know, in different creative ways that folks haven't thought about. Um, so it's like as a developer, but, but with that, a little bit of domain knowledge in biology to be able to ask some cool questions of that data. So I feel like the data snuck up on me, but then I, it was like my responsibility to ask some cool questions. Interesting. Um, yeah, but it was really in school, like uh, projects for a bioinformatics course, and um, you always had to dig up some data. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you end up getting your, uh, two questions, what did you end up getting your uh, degree in, and then what was your PhD path that you had intended? Was it on the bio side or the software side or some hybrid of the two? Yeah, so it was actually biochemistry straight up. Oh, okay. So. I did. Uh, it, I thought for the longest time that I that I wanted to do computer science. Started out there, yada yada yada. Ended up, no, maybe I want to cure cancer. You know, <laughs> biochemistry. Uh, didn't realize like I could do both uh, and cure cancer. Not really, but um, but yeah. I mean, uh, so so biochemistry for both. Um, and I was. I don't know if it reflects this exactly in my resume. I think it does, but or LinkedIn or whatever, but folks may not know that, you know, I was actually a chemist at a bench, you know, wet lab chemist for like 10 years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Before I even like came back to computer science, I was like mixing chemicals and using flasks and, you know, doing that whole deal. It was for a, it was for infectious disease and for a cancer research, but still that was what I did. Yeah. Interesting. That is very interesting. So having those experiences uh, and, and different experiences, but have them kind of shape you into or, or roll into data, where do you see data going in the future? Data, data science. Ooh, uh, let's see. Um, I guess like just applied to applied. I have to always give the caveat, but like applied ethically to new and interesting problems, um, you know, in, in my in my happy world, right? We have we have the data scientist, we have a developer, and maybe we have the customer. Whether it's you know a, a big system integrator or you know a, a, the government or edu education institutes, you know, we can uh, do some cool like things for the environment, for sustainability. Um, I know I'm answering probably a different question, oh, no. so I apologize. It's good. Yeah. Um, I see, yeah, 
yeah, I just, I see it applied in a lot of scenarios where it may not, um, cause like, okay, so I know that, you know, you have the field biologist, right? Like they're not right now probably using AI to analyze their images of insects, right. for instance, you know, to quantify how many insects are in the rainforest. Um, that might not be happening, but wouldn't it be cool if it did? Um, Cause that data is really rich and really interesting. Um, so yeah, just that's where my mind goes, I guess, with that question. I thought, you know. Interesting. Well, I think- At all answers. <laughs> no, no, I think it's, it's important because I think one of the things that's going to be a bigger and bigger part of this is ethics in AI and, I, and, and, and how it's going to touch everything. It's not just kind of, you know, uh, you know, I think it was, it was, it might've been Sacha, but I don't want to misquote the boss's, the boss's, boss's boss. But um, it's something to the effect that, you know, we used to say every, every company has a software company. Well, kind of is going to get to the point, and I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, that we're going to see every company becomes an AI company of some sort. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I see, um, I see it applied in a lot of different ways at, you know, small scales and large scales. And there's a lot to it, right? As you know, mm -hmm. um, you can't really have data science in a vacuum. Uh, data science doesn't live in its its own little world even though sometimes I wish it did because it's super fun and I love training models and, you know, working with the data, uh, image data, text data, and, 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 and just visualizing it, you know, I, it's just so much fun, you know, to me uh, and probably to you too. But uh, just seeing it like deployed out into the real world is just such a cool thing um, to see like someone build an iOS app, right? That, that does something super neat. But that story is that story is where the developer needs to come in, right? And the DevOps professional. So it's you know, data science in a vacuum. It can be done, but it's you know, more important probably to have the everyone talking together. Very well said. So then, what's your favorite part of your current gig that you have? Ooh, my favorite part. So I work with a lot of very smart, very interesting, very cool people. Um, you know, coming to Microsoft was like, was like a, I will have to be honest, it was, it was just, it was a shock because I went from a hundred person company to, uh, how big are we? <laughs> like hundred thousand. Hundred thousand plus. Yeah, hundred yeah. thousand plus. Um, so, you know, it takes a, a year or two to get used to the corporate um, thing, but I work with just, you know, as smart of people as I ever have. And uh, I think in that vein, um, getting to do work with them, but also like work that has this impact with, with some customers, with some folks, wherever, you know, whatever capacity, um, but getting to do the, the, the machine learning outside the vacuum uh, so to speak, is is my favorite part. And then within that, just learning more and more. Like, for instance, I had to figure out, and I don't know if I did a great job, but I had to figure out um, how to make a tiny little, you know, object, object detection model and put it on a, a constrained device, much like a, you know, the Raspi right. or the PX2 or, you know, those are fancy. But stuff like that right like these these small constraints just get a get a something trained how do you choose that how do you choose what framework right like you got to know about networks and layers and so i love that stuff because it motivates me uh, i get motivated to learn through my current you know task and project and then i go out and learn as much as i can about it um because i, I don't know I, I, there's something to like being the one that, that folks can be like, oh yeah, Micheline knows about computer vision stuff, you know, for a Raspi or whatever. Um, but yeah, so it's like, it's a few fold, but I think if I drill down to it at its core, it's just the, 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 I'm at a place where I get to learn things in the depths I, I kind of want to go mm -hmm. and I get the time to do it and I get to learn some really cool stuff. So it's really about, really about that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and, and you've touched on 
um, IoT type stuff. We've talked about Raspberry a bit. Is there, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, but is, is there something you can talk about that you've done with those specifically? Yeah, so there is actually, um, there's some open source stuff that that is looking really promising and, and that I've been playing with a little bit. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely can, uh, can talk about that stuff. Um, but it's a, it's a library out of, I don't know if you, of course you guys know, Microsoft Research has a cool embedded learning library oh, wow. that takes in certain models. I think, it, you know, different frameworks like Darknet and um, Keras uh, or TensorFlow, TensorFlow and Darknet. Anyway, but it's, a, it's really neat. And I hope to talk about it at a conference if I can ever find the time to write my proposal, but um, <laughs> you guys probably can relate. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but but yeah, like it's it's. Um, I've been throwing that onto some devices and and seeing how you know how fast I can get the frames per second, um, and still have good accuracy right. and. Um, thinking about different scenarios, like right now, I'm just thinking on uh, compliance and safety. So like. You know, is someone is someone safe at the job site? Uh, you know, do they have their gloves or their helmet or you know, stuff like that? Um, I think those are really cool places to go. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Were you the one that worked on that demo? I did not work on a demo for oh, okay. that. Um, it, yeah, there's a fascinating video um, that came up actually at a sales call where it was basically job site safety. Uh, and it was all running on, I guess, is that called the edge? Is that what that is? Yeah, that's absolutely okay. what it is. Because I hear people talk about edge computing and I never heard a good definition. Um, yep. So if you would be so kind as to give us a, what your definition of edge computing is. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's like, a, it's not, it sounds fancy, 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 but really at its core, it's just getting some little well, edge computing is it's getting some, some sort of algorithm onto a constrained device. And by constrained, I mean, maybe it has like, you know, it's not very fast CPU or it doesn't have a lot of RAM or it, it doesn't have very much storage on it. You know, it's, it's this tiny little thing. Like I, I keep throwing out the Raspberry Pi because that's a really good example. It only has like 16 gigabytes of hard drive space, you know, and it's only CPU, no GPU video stuff. Um, and you can't plug in another hard drive into right. it. Uh, so it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's a, tiny little system on a chip, not even a system on a chip, but you know, it's a, it's a small device. So when they talk about edge, it's like, how do we get these algorithms in a state such that they can live on these devices and, and not blow them up or you know, not, right. that they'll run um, and they'll run within those constraints. Uh, so I hope that made sense. I love the engineering awesome. aspect of that. I just, you know, I find that's the, that is a very engineering concept. I'm making up words again. Um, <laughs> we're, we'll uh, shift gears just for a minute. Uh, we have three complete this sentence questions. And the first one is, when I'm not working, I enjoy blank. Oh, yeah. So in this case, blank equals mountaineering. Oh, wow. So I, yeah, I go do that kind of stuff because I'm I'm fortunate enough to be in the state that has oddly enough tons of glaciers. Uh, I think only Alaska is the other one that has them. Wow. I think, but just getting out, you know, strapping some crampons on my feet and carrying my ice axe across some icy terrain. I, it's just my it's my happy place That's for awesome. sure. Other than data science. <laughs> <laughs> I could see then uh, that probably was a good motivator to move from Texas to Washington state. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Don't get me wrong. I love Texas, but there's some cool mountains up out here and it's really nice being out in the, out in the nowhere. <laughs> so the next complete the sentence is, I think the coolest thing in technology is blank. Yeah. So this one's kind of hard. Um, I think the coolest 
thing in technology though for me just I'm living in this in this edge world right now so the idea of the self-driving car just fascinates me um like how does how is that going to be a thing how is it a thing right right yeah. uh trust me I I <laughs> eagerly look forward to the day I can get a self-driving car so I don't have to deal with <laughs> DC beltway traffic same same oh, here um, and having driven in DC traffic, uh, <laughs> goodness. Uh, okay, last our last complete this sentence. Yeah. I'm not going to go off on DC traffic. I'm I'm, I'm resisting. Resist. <laughs> That'll be in a whole other show, Andy. It would be yes. Uh, I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. Yeah, so that one's pretty cool. Uh, because there are just so many great things, right? Obviously, I'm sure people have given some various answers to this. Um, probably the same as mine, but my my uh, blank fill in the blank would be how it's like hard to it's no it's not really hard to describe, but it's it's hard to encompass. So, in an example, something like you have a a big disaster, natural disaster, and some you know, emergency responders, whether it's, you know, the World Health Organization or certain governments putting in money, but being able to, I'm just throwing this out there, but like intelligently, maybe not machine learning, maybe, maybe machine learning, but intelligently organize not only people, but the right people to the right place for the most effective rescues or, you know, getting aid to people, et cetera, et cetera. I think that would be like, I think there's a need for that um so i would that would be really cool if technology could, could, could i totally that. agree i think that's a very uh very noble and cool use of of technology because you know in those situations logistics is everything and that's something that machine learning and ai can do really well yeah exactly exactly it's kind of where I, i'd like to see that and i think it will happen um, you know, just need to find some, some good projects to focus in on. Yeah. So. Sounds cool. Yeah. Cool. And our final question, actually our second to final question, because now that we're in season two, we've added one more, um, <laughs> is, uh, and I need to update my, uh, my list here, uh, share something different about yourself, but do you remember it's a family podcast? Yeah. So we talked about the mountaineering aspect um so you know with regards to that i think some maybe in the a different life or maybe when i retire um but i i just i'd really love to do mountain rescue oh cool um yeah i think that sounds like you know right up my alley um i have a lot to learn you know but uh maybe i can take some courses in that as they go along and uh and, and do mountain rescue, which I just realized tied into my last it does. answer. <laughs> it's a great answer. I have a theme. <laughs> Thanks. Well, it's all about, I think, a desire to help people and, 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 and use kind of your, the skills that you've acqu- acquired, right? Both on the mountain and in front of a computer. It, 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 it's, uh, it, it lines up nicely if you look at it that way. Yeah, yeah, I like to share in general hopefully sometimes very (laughs) cool very cool so i think this is our last question frank if it's not you can jump in after this and ask the real last question but um frank and i you know we travel a lot frank sits in traffic a lot and uh because he lives in northern virginia actually southern maryland you live in southern maryland and i i just say maryland maryland southern maryland is is another part of the state in my mind but yeah (laughs) Don't get me started about my dream. Nah. My uh-uh. dream is called <laughs> North Virginia. North Virginia. I would live in South Virginia, <laughs> mind you, but don't get me started. Anyway, um, there's, <laughs> I, I think it's about, we, we both listen to audiobooks. In fact, I listen to uh, a few audiobooks going back and forth to, to Bangalore uh, the past week. And, um, it was a great opportunity to, to do that. You know, when you get 18, 20 hours of travel, um, it worked out. Uh, I, I'm curious, do you, do you read, do you listen to audiobooks? books? Um, 
I do. I do. Especially when I'm on a like treadmill for like, you know, three hours with a backpack training, I, uh, I will, I will listen to these crazy like mountaineering stories so there's this one book called epic um and apparently epic means something like you don't want an epic thing to happen (laughs) on a mountaineering trip right (laughs) yeah you want want uh, nothing (laughs) right no epic uh so it's the stories about like epic mountaineering stuff and uh all around the world um and it's just really fascinating i you know, I also went to Andy, um, was it Bangalore, Bing, Bangalore? I think so. I, I, I mispronounce it, I'm sure, yeah. but yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so on the way over, you know, I, I do, I do listen to these, um, mountaineering books, but I also like to listen to, you know, scientific things, um, and data science books, data science not manuals per right. se, but, you know, like, yeah, I listen to lectures. So I'm really into the uh, Stanford, the Stanford CS vision and, and text NLP okay. uh, lectures. Very, very fascinating stuff. It, it's, it sounds awesome. One of the reasons we ask people this is uh, one of our sponsors is Audible. And we have a URL where listeners can not only go get a... Uh, not only can they sign up for Audible, but they can get a free book and sign up for 30 days for free. And the URL is thedatadrivenbook.com. So if you go there, Frank and I, I think, Frank, we get like a quarter every time somebody does that or something, which is awesome. Something like that. We get a, Every time they sign up, we get a little bit of a cut and it helps support the show Absolutely. as well as enriches your brain. Yes. Um, you know, it, I'm still working my way through yes. the Richard Branson book. Yeah, so I mean, Frank and I, we we share a lot of interest, business and technology, and um, you know, biz- now you can find a lot of books that are businesses and technology uh, out there. Um, I we also have uh, have other books that uh, that we listen to, different interests. Um, but yeah, all, all of those sound good. So when you listen to those lectures, that sounds like it's from a website rather than a book. Yeah, so that's that's some YouTube stuff. Um, but uh, the the Epic book is on Audible, and I do have an Audible account, mm-hmm. so I'm excited. I think I'll um, I'll look you guys up. The what was it the data driven book.com. Book.com. Yep. Book. Yeah, book. Cool. Cool. Nice. Yeah, if you guys. I don't know if you can see your recommendations or anything from what you guys have found to be cool, but uh, well, I'll look out for thank it. Thank you so sure. much. So awesome. That just takes you over to Audible. So if you're not signed up, you can sign up. And it sounds like you do. You have an account already, but maybe some of our listeners uh, don't. Maybe they were intrigued by your recommendation for for Epic, and uh, they could pop right over to Audible, uh, sign up download that book for free. And like I said, Frank and I would get a little bit of, of money to help support the show. But I must warn you, audiobooks are very addicting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. are. <laughs> so where can folks find out more about what, uh, uh, what you're up to, Micheline? I think the best place to see what I'm up to, especially like, well, like externally, I do a lot of data science work as well. I like put on workshops with friends. Um, but it's just check out my Twitter. Um, it's rheartpython. Uh, just r is in, yeah, r is in rapper. No, Reynolds. There we go. <laughs> we'll put a link on the show Reynolds. notes, definitely. We'll put a link in the show notes. And yep. Uh, I'm sure you hear a lot of pirate jokes and tell people that you're an R programmer. It's true. I have a skull and crossbones flag nice. up in my office too. <laughs> nice. And I like represent my past. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we'll uh, let the nice British lady finish the show. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen. Become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. 
Sign up today at datadriven.tv.